everyone. Welcome to Light on the Corner Church. I'm Kiana Karn, and this is my dad, Pastor John. We have a wonderful service for you planned. We do indeed. I can't wait to see what will happen. What do you think will happen? I don't know. I think we have a special guest, though. We do have a special guest, and I'm going to talk about him in a second. But first, I want to say uh, to all of my friends and family in the Pacific Northwest, and uh, specifically nice. around Portland, Oregon, I want to say... Na 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 na. <laughs> They're having heat wave. I think I it's going to be 114. 114. <laughs> I read 112, and I, so I said to them, "Look, Stay I, safe. you want to, you want to cool down? Come to Southern California." <laughs> Last night it uh, got down to a chilly 55 degrees uh, here in lovely downtown Montrose. So, ooh, put on another blanket. It's summer. And, uh, you know, Portland, you've got everything now. Uh, you've got Antifa, which I call Anti But Really Fa. And That's not as catchy. then the crime rate has skyrocketed, and now it's 112. So I. He's from Portland. I'm from Portland. We love I love Portland. Portland. We love Portland, the city <laughs> we of miss roses. Portland. Yeah. So we should pray for Portland. Yep. But you know, the, my childhood friends from school and everything, I, I know this on Facebook, they've all moved out uh, of Portland, out to the country, and some of them to Salem. And I think people don't give the West Coast enough credit. I people agree. People always ragging on California, ragging on Oregon. I love California. Ragging on Washington. I love... I lived here 31 years now, and before that, I was born here. So, and my parents love California too. Well, all right, we, there's other things to talk about. Certainly nothing political. Uh, I went to the border, did I tell you that? Which border? Went to the border, it's called On the Border Grill. And uh, that's my trip to the border. Yeah. And I have been to Europe. Huh? I just thought you should know. That is not, that's not connected to anything, certainly not a political comment. We've got this uh, beautiful music from the great Brian Bromberg playing in the background. He's a monster uh, bass player, just incredible musician. But I would do, you're right, I do want to tell you about, the, we have a guest today, and his name is uh, Clarence, Hi. Clarence Williams. And I asked him to talk to us a little bit about his journey to faith in Christ and I don't know the story really well, but I know it a little bit, and I love it, and I'm looking forward to it. You know Clarence? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you'll like this. And uh, so for for that reason, I think we should, and I enjoy being with you here like this, but I think we should end it so that we have time for Clarence. Yep. And then there's a sermon after this. Yeah. So let's get started. A very interesting sermon. Yeah. Let's go. Good morning, I'm here with my friend Clarence. And you know, Clarence is a Christian man, uh, but as you know, nobody is born a Christian. So that means that there had to be, at some point in your life, Clarence, a conversion. And we love, around here, we love telling our conversion stories that we also call our testimony and uh, go ahead and smile Clarence you're not yeah this is there you go see he has a nice smile doesn't it doesn't he that's great okay uh, I I could have a better smile I, ha I need some dental work actually I think you have a fantastic smile thank you so much it's so you're, you're such a discerning you're a, a you're a viewer of our YouTube service. Correct. Regular viewer. Yes, sir. Well, good. Uh, what do you think? What do you think of it? No, let me see. You watched it. You liked it enough. You agreed to be interviewed. That's my take on it. Is that right? Checks out. Good. All right. Well, let me tell you in real life, uh, Clarence is much more talkative. But I got four questions to ask you, Clarence. And uh, so I think I'll just dive in. So, but first of all, welcome Thank to a beautiful downtown Montrose. Indeed. Okay, so 
My first question is, since you didn't start out as a Christian, what was your BC, before Christ, life like? It was lost. Lost? Yeah. It was ruffled. Mm. It was fearful. I think that's a big one for me. These are scary words so far. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, before my understanding of Jesus Christ. Yeah. You know, they're in the normal secular life, I guess. You know, you can still have fun. Yeah. Young man growing up. You know. Got it. Sure. Yeah. But, um, yeah, if I want to be blunt, yeah, those What things. was your first religious experience? It was uh, being a Jehovah's Witness. You were a Jehovah's Witness? Mm-hmm. Wow. So you, that means you probably had a parent who was in Kingdom Hall and Jehovah's Witness. Is that right? It that, is. That, what is that, mom? Yeah. So your mom. Okay. Well, you know, uh, Jehovah's Witnesses and, and us, we don't see eye to eye on a lot of stuff. <laughs> you didn't knock, did you knock on doors? Yeah, because I don't remember you coming to my door. Uh, no, I don't think I ever did come to your door because mm-hmm. I don't think uh, we could. I don't know how the jurisdiction works, but the kingdom halls are all in different places everywhere, yeah. like a church area. Well, but, they come. But I did do that though. They come to my door and then they yell at me and then they never come back because <laughs> they don't they don't like what I have to say. And I always uh, ask them to join me in the flag salute. Uh, before we get started, and uh, it just goes down from there. But anyway, so uh, let's see, growing up Jehovah's Witness, and that's a whole new can of worms, but we won't get deep into that. But So that means you didn't have birthday parties, probably? Correct. Yeah, it was rough. We didn't celebrate any holidays, but seeing that my mother was the one who really wanted to go to a church, and she chose the Jehovah's Witness um, movement to be a part of. I'm really thankful that despite all that, my dad still snuck in Christmas. Oh, good. So I think that's why Christmas, even to this day, I didn't realize that yeah. until recently. That oh. I think it means more to me than I realized. That sure. I Christmas is a big day. It's understood. my favorite time of year. I love yeah. Christmas. So okay. Uh, very good. Now, uh, then at some point in your life, this is question number two, at some point in your life, you heard the gospel and the truth about Jesus from somebody. What was that like, and who told you, and what did they say when you first remember hearing the truth about Jesus? My friend Shane, who I still keep in contact with, and I have to give credit where credit's due. Thank you, Shane. Thanks, man. Danke, Shane. (laughs) Sure. (laughs) <laughs> you guys told me what that means later. It means thank you. Oh, okay. In German. Oh, all right. Yeah, danke. Yeah. And um, I grew up with him. I had known him since first grade. And um, I think him and I, we never talked about religion growing up, but it wasn't until junior high. And maybe it's because he never went to church as well. No. Whatever happened. Something happened to him. Shane. Yeah. He became Christian. Wow. And I, and I still to this day have no idea. So he didn't start out as a Jehovah's Witness. He, he no, just no, got converted. Okay. Yeah. And uh, I never thought of asking him, but he became Christian in some unknown time of us growing up, and it wasn't until junior high. I presume it wasn't long after he became a Christian because he was so adamant in the, his invitation to me to go. So he's after you. He was after you to come to church and stuff? Yeah. Well, again, Middle thank school. you, Shane. That's great. That's a good boy. Get your friends to come to church. Uh, junior high ministry is like a giant sign before the edge of a cliff that says, uh, beware. Yeah. And then high school and college ministry is down at the bottom of the cliff, picking people back up and trying to. <laughs> so junior high ministry is very important, I yeah, think. So Shane was there at just the right time. Well, that's great. All right, so uh, then what happened? And then... You went to church, I take it? I did, but after a lot of no's, I just wasn't 
maybe because of being a Jehovah's Witness, and I didn't oh. mention being a Catholic in, during middle school because okay. my mother left Kingdom Hall and that stuff okay. for her own reasons. Okay. I think I was just turned off at the idea of going to any type of religious going, institution. Sure, sure. And, uh, Organized religion, people hate it. Exactly. I became uh, disillusioned. Disillusioned. And, okay. um, you know, he just wouldn't stop asking me. And he was so good about it, you know, no matter how many times I said no. He just oh, kept great. inviting me. Yeah. And then I literally, one day, I had no reason to say no. Yeah. I, I remember, there's nothing I could I, Well, I would like to meet Shane someday. That's great. I hope I can. I'll try to arrange So he, he kept after you. You said no, but he kept after you, and you, you must have finally said yes. I did. Yeah. So I you yes. went, what, would you like to a youth group thing or it something? It was. It was a youth group at a church in Toluca Lake, technically. Mm -hmm. It was a Foursquare church. Mm -hmm. It was called Trinity Foursquare, mm -hmm. which is no longer there. Oh. And um, I went, and I had a wonderful time, and the people were so warm and welcoming. And That's Christians. Yeah. No condemnation. It's great. It was, just, it, was, it was so great. And then uh, for the first time, I had seen people playing music. Oh, in right. The church. I didn't know people even That was did probably that. pretty fun. It was, yeah. And it was worship songs. And we, do, we do music here. Yes, you do. You know. Excellently. Thank you. You're welcome. Big part of what we do. All right. So you, you heard the gospel there at Toluca Lake. That's right. And then now I will move to question number three. At some point, you decided this is for me. And uh, you believed. What was that moment like? Do you remember where you were? Or? I do. So it wasn't until fully, yeah. you know, yeah. the end of my college years. Mm -hmm. and, um, so it took a while to yeah, it did. ferment. Yeah. And... Um, I got this magazine. I went to a thrift store of sorts, and there was this magazine. I was on my way out of the store, and I felt compelled to turn around, and I did. And this vantage point that I had was was at a rack with this magazine from the American Bible Society, and it said, "Oh, the they're great, Jesus American Christ Bible Society." Yeah, Jesus yeah. Christ magazine. It was. I think it said like the life of Jesus Christ. Yeah. But yeah, and uh, I almost didn't buy it. I didn't want it. And, but it was very, very blatant in my face. And, and I remember turning around and I thought, am I gonna regret not doing this? And I thought, I think I will. So I about faced again and purchased the magazine and I went home and read it and came to understand much more of Jesus Christ and, and specifically what he did for me personally on the cross. That's and great. that's when I just broke down and I realized I need to surrender my life. Amen. Well, thank you, your minister. Thank you, Shane. Thank you, American Bible Society. Thank what you, Jesus you. did for us was uh, monumental, and it demands a response from us, and you responded. I did. That's great. So what did you do? You were at your house. You said a prayer or something like that? or Yeah, I was at the apartment I was in in Burbank. Mm -hmm. I was living at, the, at, at there, the yeah. house. Yeah, yeah. And um, yeah, yeah, the magazine is just so good about about really nailing to you the, the, the truth of the gospel, but, but initiating it in such a way where the normal person can be intrigued sure. to go on and try to discover exactly what this magazine is explaining. And then, yeah, it was a really prayer of sorts. That's great. That's wonderful. I have decided to follow Jesus. Good. Well, that's wonderful. Okay, so it took a while, and you started out in Jehovah's Witness camp. Uh, but, you know, the Lord is always calling us. He's always calling us to ourself, and he looks to me like he had you in process for a while until you said yes. The Holy Spirit said, you know what? Clarence is mine. And he, he had you turn around in that store, see that magazine, buy it, take it home, read it, and respond to the truth. Was that a, a fair way of putting it? Absolutely. Well, praise the Lord. That's great. All of us come to Christ in our own way. 
and this is your way and it's a blessed way and that's a wonderful story. Now I got one last question for you. Mm -hmm. I'm hoping you'll answer this the way I want you to and that is, uh, okay, <clears throat> from, from what I hear, all the fun in life is stuff that God doesn't approve of. So, I don't know, I, I doubt that's true. But if you could then, w now that you're a Christian, would you ever go back to your pre-Christian life? And, and if not, why not? No, never. You would not go back? Never. How come? Um, because the emptiness that you have before accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, no matter what anybody does to try to hide that, it's there, and um, I'd, ra I'd rather be found than lost. Oh, boy, that's good. I'd rather be found than lost. You can't be that. You know, that emptiness you talk about, that's a real thing. Yeah. And you can watch people trying hard to fill that emptiness with different things. Exactly. Uh, I think, thank, thank God it's Friday comes from there because the people live for the weekend. They try to fill their life with the weekend. And guess what? The weekend ends. Or with uh, getting wasted. Or with this or that or the other thing. Uh, but it leaves you empty. Somebody said, there's a God-shaped vacuum inside every human heart. Mm. And the only thing that can fill that vacuum is Jesus. And once that happens, the emptiness is gone. Your life may, may get more uh, complicated with people who don't believe like you do, but the empty, the emptiness is gone. Verily, verily. Yeah. Well, that's wonderful, Clarence. I. Thank you for sharing with us, and I appreciate it, my brother. And uh, we're happy to have you in this uh, church. You're a valuable, valuable member of this church family. Uh, thanks for not being too shy to come on camera and uh, tell your story. I appreciate it. And so if I. you want to get to meet Clarence, which I assume you do, you can join us on Sunday mornings at 1045 here in beautiful downtown Montrose, across from the Montrose Post Office, 1045. Uh, that'd be good. Thank you, Clarence. Lord bless you. You as well. All right. Good morning. To a proud church that loved eloquence and boasted about its own wisdom, and even wondered if the Holy Apostle was as wise as they were, Paul wrote these words in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, starting at verse 17. Here's what he wrote to the church in Corinth. He said, For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel not with wisdom and eloquence, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligent I will frustrate. Where is the wise person? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God the world through its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demand signs and Greeks look for wisdom. But we preach cruci Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. 
For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus who has become for us wisdom from God, that is, our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Let's begin with prayer. Father in heaven, help us to understand more and more clearly the message of the cross and the power of God. We are utterly lost without both. Now help us to preach, I pray, in Jesus' name, amen. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are preaching, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Let me put it another way. The proclamation of the cross is folly to those who are on their way to ruin, but it is the power of God to us who are on the way to salvation. You know, we, found, we sound so foolish to some, what we say, what we preach. We are maligned around the globe. Scientists make fun of us. Professors make fun of us. Politicians make fun of us. Other religions make fun of us. But you know what? That's okay. I can live with that. That's because they make fun of us, but we've been warned that this would happen. You see, it's a crucified Christ we follow. A leader nailed to a cross. But with that terrible cross comes an eternal surprise. It is the power of God to us who are being saved. Do you believe this? I'll tell you, dear ones, God's power was unleashed at Calvary and it still is. The cross that killed him saves us. That is, the miracle of redemption and transformation goes on. The power of God displayed in the lives of his children. Can we, uh, can we talk about power for a minute? The word of the cross, the preaching of the cross, the message of the cross, the proclamation of the cross is the power of God, even today, for those who are being saved. Did you know, dear ones, there is still power in the cross. There's even power in the preaching of the cross. Still today, it's true. I'm reminded of a book. In her book, The God Who Hung on the Cross, uh, by journalist Ellen Vaughn, retells the story of how the gospel came to a small village in Cambodia. In September 1999, Pastor Tui Singh 
which is not his real name. He traveled to Kampong Thong province in central Cambodia. Throughout that isolated area, most villagers had cast their lot in with Buddhism and or spiritism. Christianity was virtually unheard of there. But much to Pastor Singh's surprise, when he arrived in one small rural village, the people warmly embraced him and his message about Jesus. And when he asked the villagers about their openness to the gospel, an old woman shuffled forward. She bowed and grasped Singh's hands as she said, We have been waiting for you for 20 years. And then she told him the story of the mysterious God who had hung on the cross. She said in the, in the 1970s, the Khmer Rouge, the brutal communist-led regime, took over, along with Pol Pot, took over Cambodia, destroying everything in its path. When the soldiers finally descended on this rural village in 1979, they immediately rounded up the villagers and forced them to start digging their own graves. After the villagers had finished digging, they prepared themselves to die. Some started screaming to Buddha to save them. Others screamed to their demon spirits and others to their ancestors, their departed ancestors. But one of the women started to cry for help based on a childhood memory, a story her mother told her about a God who had hung on a cross. The woman prayed that to that unknown God on a cross, calling out to him, not knowing his name. Surely, she thought, if this God had known suffering, he would have compassion on their plight. Suddenly, her solitary cry became one great wail as the entire village started praying to the God who had suffered and hung on a cross. And as they continued facing their own graves, the wailing slowly, slowly turned to quiet crying. And there was an eerie silence in the muggy jungle air. Slowly, as they dared to turn around and face their captors, they discovered that all the soldiers were gone. As the old woman finished telling this story, she told Pastor Sang that ever since that humid day 20 years ago, the villagers have been waiting and waiting for someone to come and share the rest of the story about the God who had hung on the cross. The message of the cross, dear ones, is still the power of God. You know, think this through. Corporations today spend huge sums of money designing for themselves just the right logo. What if a company chose as its logo something like a, a hangman's noose? or a firing squad, or a gas chamber, or an electric chair. That's our logo for our company, an electric chair. You ever seen anything like that? I haven't. It would be insanity to choose an instrument of torture and death as a symbol for your organization. And yet, that's exactly what Christians have done. Just such a symbol is universally recognized 
as the logo of Christianity. Many Christians are baptized with the sign of the cross. Often churches do not merely include a cross, they are often built in the shape of a cross. Many Christians make the sign of the cross in times of danger or anxiety. Even our graves are marked with crosses. That's the power of the cross. The cross. That's what we preach. The message of the cross. The cross proclaims for all the world to hear that Jesus did for us what we could not do for ourselves. The cross proclaims that try as we might, we will never be strong enough, holy enough, or good enough to save ourselves. The cross proclaims that all those who had lost their way, that have messed everything up, that have given up hope, all these have hope after all, because Jesus died for us on the cross. That's how much God thinks you are worth the life of His Son on the cross. And it's still the power of God today. The message of the cross still unleashes the power of God. Every single day, all around the world, men and women, boys and girls, hear the truth that they need not carry the burden of their own sins any longer. That through repentance and faith in Jesus and His death on the cross, their burden can be once and for all lifted at Calvary. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. And they come running. I came running. Clarence came running. They come running for, for peace and forgiveness and hope and heaven. To the cross. These are the people who are being saved. Think about this the message of the cross breaks into the world and divides all people into just two groups those on the ru road to ruination and those on the road to salvation. Bible scholar and pastor N.T. Wright retells the following story about an archbishop who was hearing a confession of sin from three squirrely hardened teenagers in the church. All three boys were trying to make a joke out of confessing, so they met with the archbishop and confessed to a long list of ridiculous and grievous sins that they had not committed. It was all a joke to them. The archbishop, seeing through their bad practical, practical joke, played along with the first two guys who ran out of the church laughing. But then he listened carefully to the third prankster, and before he got away, he told the young man, wait a minute, okay, you have confessed these sins, now I want you to do something to show your repentance. And here's what I want you to do. I want you to walk up to the far end of our church, and I want you to look at the picture of Jesus hanging on the cross. And I want you to look at his face. And I want you to say this. You did all that for me, and I don't care. And I want you to say that three times. 
So the boy went up to the front, looked at the picture of Jesus, and said, You did all that for me, and I don't care. And then he said it again a second time. And then he paused. Because he couldn't say it a third time, because he broke down into tears. And the archbishop, telling the story, said, Now the reason I know that story is true is because I was that young man. Dear ones, there's something about the cross, something about Jesus dying there for us, which leaps over all the theoretical discussions, all the possibilities of how we explain it this way or that way. And the power of the cross holds us. And when we are held captive by it, somehow we have a sense that what is holding us is the powerful love of God on the cross. Dear ones, today the truth is the old rugged cross makes us a target to the world for scorn and ridicule. But don't feel too bad because we know something the world doesn't. The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing but to us who are being saved. It is the power of God. Praise His name. Let's bow in prayer. Holy Father, may we embrace the message of the cross and the power of God here in America again. And Lord, why not begin that revival right here, right now, in Montrose, in us? We humbly ask this in Jesus' strong name. Amen. Hi, everybody. Thank you for watching. Uh, Mark, what's question for today is, which church thought they were wiser than the Apostle Paul. Which church thought they were wiser than the Apostle Paul? Okay, leave your answers in the comment section below. Be sure to like this video, um, subscribe, comment whatever you like in addition to the quiz question. Um, Check out the links in the description below. They'll lead you to our website and giving options. And that's about it, right? Yep, okay, have a wonderful week. We hope to see you tomorrow. Um, But if not, we will see you here next week. Lord bless. Have a wonderful week.
Thank you.